Now, this brings up the whole topic of death because notice he mentions death two times in these verses. Even if he lives, even if he uh, dies, he will live. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. We need to understand what the Bible means when it talks about death. There are three kinds of death stated for us in Scripture. Now, the word death in Scripture has the idea of separation. When you think of death, always think of separation. Don't think of annihilation or something ceasing to exist, because when a person dies, they don't cease to exist. There's a separation that takes place. Let me, let me uh, uh, flesh this out a bit. You remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Whenever uh, God spoke to Adam, He said, Adam, don't eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, the moment that Adam and Eve ate from that fruit, what happened to them? They died spiritually. They were separated from God. Think about that. Adam and Eve were the only people to be unborn again. You know, the rest of us, we're born sinful and separated from God, and we come into relationship with God, and then we come to know Him, and that separation uh, is, is, is uh, uh, eradicated, and we come into relationship with God. They had that, and when they ate of that, they died spiritually and were separated from God. Now then, ultimately, some 900 years later, then they would die physically, So physical death is a separation. When a person dies physically, the body stays here, and the soul, the spirit, the immaterial part of that person separates from the body. And if they're a believer, that soul, that spirit goes to be with the Lord. If they're an unbeliever, it goes to Hades, where it awaits uh, the judgment. But there's a separation that takes place. Spiritual death is spiritual separation from God. And that's the condition that all of us are born into this world in. Because of the sin of of Adam, we are spiritually separated from God. And when we trust Christ as our Savior, God brings us back into fellowship and relationship with Himself. But the third kind of death is eternal death. Or in Revelation 20, it's called the second death. And the second death is eternal death, that is eternal separation from God. And I know there are many today who are trying to to come up with a a kinder, gentler view of the afterlife, if you will, for the lost. And they're saying, well, you know, at some point there's, uh, you know, people are just going to be annihilated or, uh, you know, hell's not going to last forever or really nobody's ultimately going to end up there. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, the Bible says broad is the gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many of there will be who find it. And the Bible tells us, I think in as clear a language as you can find, that hell is eternal in its duration. You know, the idea of hell and people being judged doesn't bother me. It's the duration of it that, that causes me the problem. And that's a difficulty. I think anybody who doesn't uh, face that has not really thought it through. But I believe that's what the Bible teaches. And we don't know. You know, no one here on this earth really knows anything about life after death. We know nothing about it. If we're going to know anything about it, someone from outside time and space is going to have to come tell us about it. And I believe that's what God has done for us in His Word. And I'm going to believe what God says and not try to make it up however I want it to be. Because I don't know. I have no clue, and neither does anybody else. We have to have divine revelation. God's given it to us in His Word, and we need to trust that. But that's the eternal death. A lot of you have heard the old saying before, if you're born once, you're going to die twice. If you're born twice, you're only going to die once. You ever heard that? In other words... If you're born once, that is, if you're just born physically, you're going to die twice. You're going to die physically, and then you're going to die eternally. You're going to die eternally um, in the lake of fire. But if you're a believer and you've been born twice, that is, you've been born physically and you've been born again spiritually, you're only going to die once, that is, in physical death, and you might not even die once if the rapture happens in our lifetime. You know, they all say, when you've been born twice, you may not die at all. You may be caught up uh, to be with the Lord.
But that's what Scripture speaks of when it speaks of death. And these, all three of these forms of death is what Christ has overcome, being the resurrection uh, and the life. Now, I want to look at this in some more detail. There's a lot more to this idea of resurrection than a lot of people realize. And I don't want to get too complicated. I want to make this as clear as we can. But I want us to understand the pattern or the program of resurrection. Uh, Look back in John 5 for just a moment. John chapter 5. We're going to look at these three verses, uh, John 5, 25 to 29. Acts 24, 25, and Revelation 25 and 6. These three passages lay out for us kind of uh, the resurrection program of God. And what they're going to tell us is there are two resurrections. There are two kinds of resurrection. And I want us to see that here. Look in John 5, 25. This is, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming... And now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear shall live. For just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave the Son also to have life in Himself. Now, I think this is talking here about spiritual life, because He says, an hour is coming, and now is. In other words, it's present. When all those, when those who are dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and will live. And that's what happens when a lost person is brought under conviction by the Holy Spirit, and it's as if God comes and speaks to them, and they hear His voice, and they turn to Christ, and they put their faith in Him. And He says they come to life spiritually. But look at verse 27, or, or verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming. Now, notice he doesn't say an hour is coming and now is. This is future. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. They shall come forth, those who did the good to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil to a resurrection of judgment. Now, this is fascinating. Jesus says, look, there's a day coming when everybody who's in the tombs, they're going to hear the voice of the Son of God, and they're going to come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, and those who did the evil to a resurrection of judgment. Now, he's not saying here that we're saved by our works. Our works show what we really are. Those who do the good, those are who, those who've trusted in the Lord. They're going to have a resurrection of life. Those who do the evil to a resurrection of judgment. So there's two resurrections. There's a resurrection for the righteous, for believers, and there's a resurrection for the unrighteous. Did you know that even unbelievers are going to be resurrected? They're going to receive resurrection bodies. Now, the quality of the body will be different from our bodies. Our bodies, when we're resurrected, will be glorified, immortal, imperishable bodies fit for heaven. Now, I don't know what the resurrection bodies of the lost will be like, but they will be some type of bodily form. They won't be glorified bodies, but they will be bodies that will never perish. So there's two resurrections. Look over in Acts chapter 24. We see the same thing there. Acts chapter 24 and uh, verse 25. Or I'm sorry, 15, 24, 15. I wrote down the wrong verse there. Acts 24, 15. Paul says here, We have a hope in God which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection both of the righteous and of the wicked. So there's two resurrections. These are two kinds of resurrection, one of life, one of death, one of the righteous, one of the wicked. And then over in Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6, it speaks there of the resurrection of believers at the end of the tribulation period. The resurrection of believers there is called the first resurrection Then he says the rest of them, that would be the unbelievers, they don't come to life for a thousand years till the end of the millennium. Now that would be, of course, uh, the second resurrection. So let me put a little chart up here that maybe will help us see this, and we're going to go through this in some more detail. There are two resurrections. 
There's a resurrection of life and a resurrection of judgment, a resurrection of the righteous, a resurrection of the wicked, a first resurrection and a second resurrection. These are uh, the two resurrections uh, that will take place in the future. Now, hold with me here in just a moment. I'll put a chart up here that I think will help us see all of this. Look over at one more passage in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 20 to 24. You see, uh, amillennialists and postmillennialists, they teach what's called a general resurrection. They teach that one of these days at the second coming, Jesus is coming back to earth. That's going to be when we're raptured because we're going to go through the whole tribulation according to them. We're going to be raptured to meet the Lord. We're going to come back to the earth, make a U-turn and come back down. And everybody who's died of all the ages is going to be resurrected. There's going to be one big judgment of everybody, and that's going to be it, and we're going to go into eternity. So they just see one big general resurrection. But notice in in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, this is the great resurrection chapter. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. Notice what he says in verse 23, though. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and after that those who are Christ's at his coming. So there's a division or a sequence in God's resurrection program. The word order here, he says, each one's going to be resurrected in his own order. This is the only time this word's used in the New Testament, and it's a military term for bodies of troops in various numbers. In other words, you've got company A, and they march by, and then you've got company B, and they march by, and then you've got company C. They're each in their own company or each one in their own order. So the Bible teaches there will be different groups resurrected at different times. Now, the question is, when's this going to happen? Well, you can see this chart here, and I know the writing's a bit small. I'm, I'm sorry for that. I got this chart. It's a good one, though, I think. This gives us the two resurrections. Now, notice those first three arrows there are all the resurrection of life. They all have to do with Christ or believers. And then over here at the the far right, you have the resurrection of judgment. The resurrection of life, the first resurrection, is going to happen in stages. The resurrection of judgment of all the lost is going to happen all at one time at the end of the millennial kingdom at the great white throne. That's when all the lost are going to be resurrected. But the resurrection of believers, or the resurrection of life, occurs in stages. The first fruits of all resurrection was Jesus Christ. Because if Christ isn't raised, nobody else is going to be raised. That's the whole argument of 1 Corinthians 15. And I like that statement I have there on the left. The best news the world ever heard came from a graveyard. And that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When he conquered death and sin and hell and the grave. And you remember what 1 Corinthians 15 says? It says, Christ is the first fruits. He's the down payment or the guarantee. In Israel, when their crops were coming in, they would take uh, an offering and give an offering of the first fruits of the very first to come in. And that was a down payment or a guarantee of more to come. And so the resurrection of Jesus is the down payment or the guarantee that there's going to be more to follow in the future. Now, when's the the resurrection of believers going to take place? It's going to take place in two phases or two stages. Look over in uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the great uh, rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, 13 to 18. You remember in this passage what had happened. Uh, Paul had uh, gone on his second missionary journey, and he'd gone uh, from Troas in modern-day Turkey across over to Greece. He'd gone to Philippi and was run out of there and went down uh, to the city of uh, Thessalonica. Thessalonica. 
And uh, he spent about six or eight weeks there, probably on his second missionary journey. But you remember some people came to faith in Christ and Paul was run out of town. And he ends up down in Corinth and he's concerned about the believers back there. And he finally gets news from Timothy that they're doing well. And he writes 1 Thessalonians back to them probably about six months later. But what had happened in the meantime, Paul had taught these believers a lot about prophecy, a lot about the end times, which, by the way, let me just pause for a moment and say this. This is uh, is, uh, a statement I like to make here. If you read 1 and 2 Thessalonians, you'll read that Paul had taught the Thessalonians about the rapture. He taught them about the Antichrist. He had taught them about the day of the Lord. He taught them about uh, the, or the tribulation. He taught them about the removal of the restrainer. Paul was with these people for six to eight weeks of time, was all he was there. And he taught them all of that. I like to say today that people could go to church for 30 years and never hear that stuff. Isn't that true? Sad, isn't it? People today would say, well, we don't need to tell people about prophecy and get them all confused about that. You know, that's for the, that's for the future. You know, that's in the, the sweet by and by. We don't need to worry about that. Well, I always like to say, you know, prophecy helps us live in the nasty now and now as well. But Paul taught them these things. And, and people will always say, too, well, the last thing you ever want to teach a new Christian is all this, you know, prophecy. These are people who just come out of paganism. Paul was there six to eight weeks. He taught them the rapture the day of the Lord, the the man of sin, the removal of the restrainer, all of those things. Now, again, we don't want to be obsessed with Bible prophecy, but it's part of a well-balanced diet for a believer, and we need to know it, and it needs to be preached in our churches, and it's not being being taught, and people are ignorant of it today. Anyway, that's that's that statement. There's no extra charge for that little soapbox message there this morning. But the, the situation at Thessalonica was after Paul left, some of the believers there had died. And so the question they had wondered about is, well, okay, we know about this rapture, Paul, you've told us about, but, but do those who die before the rapture, are they going to be part of it? Um, are they going to be second-class citizens? Uh, how do they fit into the events of the end times, those who've died? And so Paul says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren. And the old King James says, ignorant brethren. And uh, I heard Warren Wiersbe say once, that's the fastest growing denomination in America is the church of the ignorant brethren. But uh, sad, sad but true, I think. But he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, about those who are asleep. Now, the word sleep is a euphemism for death. And sleep refers to the body, not the soul. The Bible does not teach soul sleep, that the soul sleeps in the grave and then is going to be uh, brought out someday. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's the body that falls asleep, and the soul, the spirit of a believer, immediately goes to be with the Lord of the unbeliever, uh, goes uh, to Hades. So at death, remember again, we said there's a separation that takes place. The body falls asleep. It's an old uh, tombstone I heard about years ago of a man named Solomon Pease. His last name was spelled P-E-A-S. And it said, here lies the body of Solomon Pease under the grass and under the trees. But Pease is not here, only the pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. (laughs) Now, to me, that's a good description of what happens when uh, a believer dies. The pod stays here and the peas, uh, they shell out to go be with God. And by the way, the word asleep here for the body is the Greek word, it comes from the word koimao. And a word came from that in ancient times, the word koimetoria. And we get our word cemetery from that word. And that word was used back in those days of, uh, of a cemetery, of a graveyard, but it was also used of a dormitory. In other words, it's a sleeping place. And so when you go by a graveyard, it's a sleeping place for bodies awaiting the resurrection of when the Lord comes. The soul of that person, the spirit is with the Lord if they're a believer. If they're an unbeliever, it's in Hades. But the body there is asleep uh, awaiting uh, the day of resurrection. Notice what Paul says here. He says, I tell you this, these things. He says that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now, he doesn't say we don't grieve but he says we don't grieve like people who have no hope. 